And so today we're going to kind of follow up part two of what we were talking about last week because what we want to be is free. We want to be free to be ourselves, not to harm people, but to bless them with who we are. And we began by looking at the fact that uh, Psalm 139 is obviously one of the best chapters in the Bible ever written, one of the best songs ever written. And uh, it started off, we talked about it, how to live in freedom, how to be free to be me. And if you didn't get a chance to listen in, go back online, you can check it out because this is kind of a follow-up to that. Because I believe that every human being was created to live in freedom, to be the unique person that God designed, to bear the image of God to the world. That's why we were saved, so that we could show the world what Jesus Christ looks like because they're not going to see him any other way. But there's a problem. To retain freedom, i got to fight. I got to hang on to that, and I want to open with following where we were last week in verse 13 of Psalm 139. All right, take out your notes. It says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Now, this is poetic language. He's not talking about the scientific process of reproduction. He says, you, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because... I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Now, David is just breaking out into a song about the wonder of the human body and the wonder that he is. And I was just thinking, have you looked at your hand recently? Everybody pick up your hand. Look at your hand, all right? Just, you see the little wrinkles you were born with on the inside of your hand? You look at the back of your hand, okay, I got some hair there, hair on the second knuckle, that's a little weird, okay, you ever do that? Some people have a lot of hair on the second knuckle, I don't, I got a little, that's genetic, I don't know why. Just look at the miracle, my hands, my fingernails, some of you bite your nails, some of you are trying not to bite your nails, and you know, I mean, just kind of your hands are you. And this got me to thinking of all the miracles that are a part of our body. And I was thinking of the, the, just the systems. I'm kind of a science geek and a biology person. I was thinking of the miracle of respiration. Our, our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made because God made me wonderfully, and he did. And I think respiration is where I take in, everybody take a deep breath, ready? One, two, three. Let it out. So when you took it in, you took oxygen from our atmosphere. There's a lot of oxygen in this room because there's a lot of green plants in Florida. We take in oxygen. We expire some carbon dioxide with a lot less oxygen in our breath going out because the circulatory system works with the respiratory system. The circulatory system takes the oxygen that we need in red blood cells to the extremities of our body, and it all happens like that. When our heart beats up and down, up and down, up and down, it takes oxygen to where it needs to be, but it also pumps the deoxygenated blood back toward where it needs to be reoxygenated. Okay, you got all that? That's your circulatory system. You got blood that's moving all the time in your body. You, you're not even aware of it. God designed you so wonderfully. It, the only time you know that you have blood is if something bad has happened, right? Otherwise, it just stays where it should. That's where, where is your blood? Where it should be. But if you cut an artery, it will let you know it's on the move, right? You know, and under your arm and all these things. And maybe if some of you have done that. I was thinking the reproductive system. That's an amazing thing. Where a man and a woman come together and without being graphic, here's what happens on a cellular level to create you. That first single cell that you had, when it divided, it had parts of mom and parts of dad. It, the double helix form uh, is a beautiful thing. It's a ladder that if I tried to draw it, I don't know if I can, but we're going to try anyway because this is the third service and I can do this. Okay, and there's a ladder, 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 ladder. And so the genetic code that, you, that makes you you is written all over these rungs of each individual ladder. Da, 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 da. I could just come up with a picture quicker. Okay, but what happened was, here's mom and dad, okay? Right down the middle, their DNA strands, this DNA strands, this DNA strands, and all, these, all the things that make you you, they came together. It's almost as if, it, as if David knew biology before biology, right? And how you are literally DNA that was knitted together in a moment's 
of, of conception where God made you fearfully and wonderfully. I just think all the traits that I have for my father and all that I have for my mother, I didn't get all of either. Praise God. I am not a copy of either. I am my unique person. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's just a little bit about what science is uncovering about the beauty of the human body, right? I don't think science and religion are on opposite ends of any spectrum. They go together. The more I understand about the human body, the more I understand about the intricacies of our creation, the greater respect I have for the creator. The more it makes me see, oh my, the design, the order, the wonder, the beauty, all of those are given to us as gifts for us to lift up our eyes and say, if there is a creation, there must be a creator. And what, 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 what religion gets a bad rap for is, well, you can't explain origins. The only origin story that God gives us is that God said, let there be light, and there was light. I don't know how he did it. Did he make planets collide? Did he make planets first and then make them collide? Did it, was it a bang? Was it a whisper? I don't know, because nobody was there, right? But the fact that we have, just, just think of the human body. No other animal on the planet. Just think of humans. The fact that we are genetically encoded. I mean, every gene, there's four little protein or enzymes on each gene. It's amazing. So, pastor, you don't get it. It's over time, through chance, the universe self-created. Okay, I hear that. But again, your evidence is a lot more scant than mine. Here's the deal. It takes more faith for me to believe that this universe was created out of chance, that my human body was not designed, it just happened over time. I found out that time doesn't always do good things. A lot of times time, well, pastor, we're talking billions and you can't conceive in millions of years. I'm just telling you, if you open your eyes of faith, if you have enough faith to take the first step to say, okay, if I see your, I see your point, pastor, creation has a wonderful design and order to it. Okay, if you can get, if we can agree on that one, I'm asking you to, if you'll just take the next step to say, if there was a creator and he created this creation, if he's personal, I need him to reveal himself to me. If you'll pray that prayer, if you'll say, okay, if there is a creator, if he, he created this creation, if he can reveal himself to me, I'll believe. And here's what I know, he will. He will bridge the gap between your unbelief and all your excuses and the God of the universe that exists. And the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God, all right? So we have to take a step of faith, and it's not a, just a, a, a leap of faith, it's, it's a calculated move. Because if there is a creator, wouldn't it be cool to get to know them, the guy or the gal or whoever God says he is? He says he's Father God, but I know people say, well, he's Mother God too. Well, he's both, right? All right, all right, there we go, amen, there we go. Since so, so one of the mamas from the crowd, all right. <laughs> I was thinking, okay, the, the miracle of reproduction, what about digestion? The miracle of digestion, many of your stomachs are growling right now. As you contemplate Burger 21 or whatever place that your family makes their lunch home at on Sunday afternoon. For many of you, this is a tradition. And for next week, we're messing with your tradition. I'm sorry, I, I am. Remember, none of us like change, but then again, yes, we do. Because we like variety in what we eat, right? Okay, so you like change sometimes, just not always. And I get it, and, I, and we're not trying to mess with anybody by changing service times. My hope is that this group will kind of split. Many of you will go to 11.30, and many of you will go to 10 o'clock. You say, Pastor, I think everybody will go to 10, because everybody's used to getting, going to church and going to lunch together. Only the real churchy people are used to going to church and lunch together. Many of you come to Christ in your adult life, and you are just so glad that we can sleep in on Sunday. Say amen. All right? You can sleep in on Sunday and still be a Christian and come to church at 1130. I would love that. And, and it w what was really affirming for me was on our vacation when we went to the 12 noon mass in New York City, and we saw 1,000 people there. 
So I thought, well, it can work. So just, just give it a shot, and uh, we'll see what happens, all right? But the more science observes, and the more it reports, the more amazed I am at God, and I love this scripture, right? Okay, so God formed me wonderfully, but he formed me for friendship. Look what it says in, in verse 13. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. In other words, God thinks of you a lot. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. I'm still with you. That's a weird way to put it, isn't it? When I'm awake, I'm still with you. Well, God's with you too. Well, he's talking about maintaining a relationship here. God formed me for friendship. And David is saying, listen, when I wake up in the morning, it's like I'm going, hey, God, what's going on today? Good morning, God. I'm still with you. I know you're thinking of me. And I was a little bit overwhelmed emotionally this week. Change is hard for me too, okay? I'll just be honest with you. Because I want to make everybody happy. I love you guys. I really do. And I'm praying about the changes and how it's going to affect our church. And I'm believing for God to send more people who are far from him to our church. Because here's the cool thing. We are reaching so many more people than we reached five years ago. We've got to make room. And that's a good thing. But it's painful for me as, as a pastor leading you through the process of change. But I love them. Those who don't know Christ but will. And their preference is a little more than I love my preference. So this is why we're moving forward with this. And, and just so you know that. But I was thinking of the friendship. God is my friend. And so I was writing in my journal. I was praying a prayer. And most of the time I take it for granted that God is listening. But something stopped me in my head. It went like this. Brett, do you understand there are 7 billion other people on the planet? And I'm listening to you right now. Pray a prayer on paper. And I was like, wow. The same God that created this universe so wonderfully has time for me. The Bible says such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I don't understand how he did all of that and how he still cares for me, but he does. Because not only does the Bible affirm his friendship, the Holy Spirit of God has some way of coming to me in my spirit and making me know it's true. You know, I'm not deluding myself. There is a supreme being that truly does love me and he formed me for friendship. So when I'm in fellowship with God, that's when I'm the real me. But there are some things that keep us from this wonderful freedom and I was just gonna list them in your notes there. there, there there's a few things, just five I came up with. You could, you could list 15 more. What keeps me from freedom? What keeps people? Well, number one, ignorance from, uh, uh, about Jesus keeps people away from God. They don't know Jesus. They don't know how to have a relationship with him. Or it doesn't make sense. Maybe some of you, you grew up in a home that was very um, cold when it came to religion. Your parents still don't believe. And you're thinking, well, wonder what... How do we change that? Maybe you have relatives or friends that you would love to come to Christ, but they've never sat down and, and listened and thought it through. Or if they have, the second reason they are, aren't experiencing the freedom is a lack of faith in the saving work of Jesus. Maybe you've heard the message. Maybe your parents or your friends have heard the message, but it's not connected. Because they, to, to take that step of faith in Jesus Christ is, is a little bit of a gamble. Because you're saying, okay, I'm putting my future into the hands of a God I can't see. I'm giving my will and my heart to the creator of the universe, yet I still need some evidence. I still need some surety. And, and, and maybe you just need too much from God without taking that step first. See, what happens is you take the step of faith first then saving faith follows. It's weird. It's a weird thing. The more, the more steps of faith you take, the easier it becomes. But that first one, <laughs> sometimes it can be a doozy. Some people don't have the faith to get there. H how do you change that? Well, you continue to pray for them and continue to invite them to church or invite them to places where they know they're going to be exposed to the truth. Number three is self-deception. That's what keeps me from, you know, we lie to ourselves all the time. And, you know, that donut won't hurt me, right? <laughs> 
or I can watch that and it's okay, or whatever, you know, we, we, we lie to ourselves, this affair won't hurt my marriage, it'll actually enhance it. No, that's, that's a lie though, people believe that, or our divorce won't hurt our children, they're resilient. Those are, those are lies that get us to the place that we would not normally go, but we've got to to make it palatable. There's a lot of different ways we lie to ourselves. Apathy is the fourth reason I was thinking of. People just quit pursuing their faith. They don't live in freedom because it is, it is a fight. I've seen this among parents. Their kids go off to college, and, and then they just kind of lose a reason to go to church. They just kind of fade out because they were going to church for the kids, and now the kids are gone they had forgotten that they have a faith of their own where they had to stoke the fires and they hadn't done it. I've seen it with kids that go off to college or leave their parents' home. They were raised in a Christian home, but it never connected to them. And as soon as they got out the doors, they jettisoned their faith. It happens a lot. But the, the, the most simple reason is sin. And sin, if you look at the human heart, all of us, since Adam, since we carry his DNA, part of what we're encoded with is we have a sinful nature. The desire to do wrong when right is presented, right? We, we kind of not, we don't want to do wrong all the time, but it's that self-will. So if you will, original sin, the best way to describe original sin, what the Bible calls our sinful nature, is it just, I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to, and, and we see it from birth. You go to the toddler room, everybody wants mine, right? And the first word that most kids learn is no. <laughs> because we're born with a nature that wants our own will. It's also self-preservation. It's, it's kind of mixed up in there. You say, well, how does sin enter the heart of a Christian? How, I thought we were supposed to be cleansed. Well, part of the problem is there's, there's stuff in our life. Maybe, uh, let's just say this is the human heart, your will. It's been cleansed. You're a Christian. So you had a white heart, but there's just like some issues in your life that you still haven't gotten past, and, and God's reminded you, but you've you said, well, not, not now. I'm not going to deal with that right now. I'm going to keep that in my life. You say, I'm a pretty good person, Pastor, because I've got a lot more good deeds. They outweigh my bad deeds. If you, if you look at the negative scale and you see Hitler down here, Hitler's always my bad guy, and you see Mother Teresa over here. Um, is it T-H or, oh, well, we'll just go with the French spelling. There we go. All right. Mother Teresa there, Okay. And um, I'm somewhere in between. Uh, I give to the poor. I give to the church. I'm pretty good most of the way around. Go to church a couple times a week. So I don't have much on my chart, Pastor. There's a few issues, nothing big, really. And, and, and um, maybe, maybe more like this. If you say that's, there's a little, little dark, well, maybe a little more. I mean, just, uh, that's still probably 80-20, right, Pastor? Is that right? And so people think, oh, that's... That's freedom, right? I'm, I'm saved. Got the blood of Jesus coming in from above, you know. I'm saved by the cross. And, and I'm going to go ahead and let the, I'm just going to go ahead and, me and Jesus, but then I got my own deal going on the side here. Just a little bad. I'm not all bad. I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm here, <laughs> right? Here's the deal. There's no way you can ever be free to be your true self until you understand that freedom can't be earned. It's a gift you've got to receive. And it involves this. Because little things can do big damage. So when Mindy was diagnosed three years ago, um, the doctor got us in their office, in, in our primary care doctor. You never want to go in his office where they have the pictures. You always want to be in a room that has like stuff that cuts you and all that. So when he brought us into the room where there were pictures, it was his personal office, and, you know, they said, Mindy, you probably need to bring your husband. We knew it was probably bad news. They had done a biopsy of a small piece of tissue, and, and they got the results back, and, and he said, he kind of danced around the issue, and so we asked him the question, was, was it cancer? And he goes, yes, it, it's cancer. Deep breath. Okay. You hear the word, doesn't really do much until about an hour later and you go crud that stinks okay what's next so go to the next doctor and she assures us that we found this thing it's about the size of a uh, eraser pencil eraser 
and a grain of rice. There's another place a little further away. And what we're going to do is we're going to excise those, and then uh, we're going to radiate the area. And that radiation is kind of like a big sunburn that never goes away. And we're going to just make sure that that stuff doesn't come back. And we're going to get it, and that's going to be it. So the doctor goes in, and they cut that little thing about the size of a pencil eraser, and they cut outside of it just enough to where they said the margins are clear. The tissue outside of what we cut is cancer-free. All right, good. So they send this stuff off to test it because on a microscopic level, not every cancer is the same. Some are slow-growing, some are fast-growing, some are different. Well, the report came back, and this one was different. It was a bad kind of nasty little tumor. In fact, there could be more of its kind hiding out in all parts of Mindy's body. So that little bitty thing that was teeny weeny and, you know, compared to her body weight was negligible. Would kill her if it wasn't dealt with. So little things, little things. That's not a big thing, Pastor. When we come together on Sunday morning, I don't know if you understand this, but life and death are on the line every week because some of you are in this season where you are receptive to hear what I'm saying. Next week, if you don't listen today, Next week, your heart is going to be a little bit harder. So when I start to talk next week, your hands are going to go to your phone. You're going to check in with all your Insta friends, and you're not going to hear God's voice because today is the day he wants to deal with that little thing because little things can kill you. It can kill your family and your marriage, and some of you are just starting out in marriage, and you're like, Pastor, this is way harder than I thought. She doesn't treat me like Mama. And he doesn't treat me like dad did. And oh boy. And that's one of the hardest, hardest realizations in marriage that Mindy didn't love me like my mommy did. <laughs> she loved me different. And learning to work around all of that. And I didn't love her like her daddy did. I didn't go and fill up her car with gas every time her car needed gas. Her dad did that, but not her husband, the lazy bum, right? <laughs> So marriage is hard. And I'm talking to some of you who are young in it. And you are ready to hear it today. It's a little thing in your marriage, but it's going to explode if you don't deal with it today. And it's not in them, it's in you. It's in you. It's in all of us. See, what happens is we think we can do it on our own. And then if, if not do it on our own, let's go get a book. All right, let's get a marriage book. Let's get a family book. Let's get a self-help book. Some, some, tell us how to do it better. And the Apostle Paul had the list. It was called the Law of God. All of the Old Testament given to God's covenant people. The Apostle Paul was diligent in his faith. He wanted to eliminate this through obeying the law, keeping all the rules, because that's all he knew to do. But look at his honest admission in Romans chapter 7. Look at this. you got to go deep with me. I'm going to go five minutes deep theology, and I'm going to bring it out to why this matters for us today. Look what he said. Now we're going to read a bit. He said, I need something more. In other words, I'm not doing so well, for I know the law. I know all the rules, but I still can't keep it. And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. Does that not sound like the human condition sometimes? My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Folks, this is in the Bible from a man who's a great man of God. He's trying to explain to us how hard it is on our own to live a good life. He said, something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decided to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands. I really do love God's word, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts 
of me. Parts of me covertly rebel. And just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Now the rhetorical question. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? Paul comes to the end of the rope. But he doesn't want to end there. Because he knows that's not the end. Look at verse 25. The answer thank God is that Jesus Christ can and does I like those present tense words (laughs) he acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different now if you were presented with those complaints you would see what a life of double-mindedness looks like I want to do good I can't do good I don't want to do bad I end up doing bad that's what life is like before trusting Jesus Christ and his spirit to help us with this so the only way to true freedom no, no to be the real me is to allow Jesus to save me from my sins and when we do that the Bible says in the next verse look at verse one so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ because, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. There's no condemnation. There's no the darkness God deals with. And I've heard it said that the devil doesn't need to come into a human life and just have everything. Like if he... In, in a home. He doesn't need to redecorate, tell you where to put the couch, what, flat, what, what things to put on the wall. In your life, all he needs is a nail. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor? All he needs is one nail to hang things on in your home. All, you just kind of like roadkill, if you will, to put the things that you're ashamed of on display, to put the pictures of the people that you've not forgiven in your mind every time you try to get ahead. So if the devil has a nail in your life and it looks about like that, something that he owns in you, every time you try to do right, the wrong thing pops up. Every time you wanna go this way, the smell of death defeats you. You say, man, I've tried and failed, I've tried and failed. So the devil just puts on that nail the word failure. So every time you try to get ahead, failure. In your life, it might be the fact that you didn't have a parent who was around at a critical time. You missed out on a a mother's love or a father's love. So for you, the devil, all he has to do is say, unloved. For you, you were called names, right? And so for you, the devil just puts a little plaque and just puts on there, not worth it. Not worth the time. Maybe somebody spoke evil into your life and said you would never amount to anything. So every time you try something, the devil reminds you, you'll never amount to anything. That just one nail in your life. And you come up to that and you try to remove it and you can't. You say, well, how does the church help in this case? Or where do I start to regain freedom? If that's the human dilemma, if every time I try to get ahead, I just two steps forward, one steps back, one step back, I, well, first, number one, I allow God to search my heart. When we come together, part of what I allow God to do, is say, God, search me. That's what, that's what David said. Get back to Psalm 139. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Like, we're all anxious about different things. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting so I allow God to search my heart for the nails on the wall of my soul that the devil hangs his roadkill on all the things all the ways I've failed all the ways others have failed me one of the things I've found as a pastor is most of the time this is just unforgiveness when you don't forgive another human being it's a darkness in your heart 
They're made in the image of God to forgive and give grace. But what they did to you was so horrible and it's so easy to hang on to and it's so easy to make sense of when you, you say, well, somebody has to pay. And for you, the little thing of what they did to you has become a big thing because now there's 10 people just like them that did the same thing to you and you've got a list and it's taking over. And so when you want to be with God in that quietness, all you can see of the people that have wounded you and not God's love for you. So search me, God, for the things that are small that may kill me. Well, the, the, the small cancer from Mindy's body told a big story. It was an aggressive, fast-growing, nasty cancer. And the doctor, the oncologist came to us and she looked at the report and she said, you're gonna need more than radiation, which is the permanent sunburn. You're gonna need chemotherapy. And Mindy started crying. We didn't know what that was, what it all meant. But basically said, what's gonna happen is the chemotherapy goes into a human body and it kills all the fast growing cells because fast growing cells are what cancer is. I mean, they, they just reproduce without nucleus. They, they re reproduce incorrectly. That makes them a poison to the body. They get too big. They, they cause, you know, failure. But it's also gonna cause you to lose your hair because hair is fast growing. That's why you see a cancer patient. They don't have hair because the chemotherapy has attacked those good cells because in trying to get at the bad cells, it's got to kill some good ones too, and, and it's, it's toxic to your body, and you don't want it very often. This was a picture of the first one that was given to Mindy. It's called adriamycin. They call it the red devil because of the side effects. It instantly causes pain to you, and she only had four rounds of this one, thank God. And uh, they call it the red devil, and Mindy said, I don't like that. You know, me in my non-literal way, I was like, get over it. You know, like it just, that somebody said that. But then I was like, oh, okay, so what are we going to call it? And uh, we decided to call it the blood of Jesus. <laughs> now, I know I'm not original in that. I've never heard it, anybody else call it that, but that's what we called it. Because we know in spiritual terms... When we come to Jesus and we search me, remember when Jesus died on the cross and he, the Bible says it's his blood that provides healing. By his wounds, we are healed. We're made whole. So that blood of Jesus. Now, I, let me get, let me get uh, just kind of for some of you literal people in here. It happens in a spiritual way. When we accept forgiveness, we are literally accepting this transfer where God forgives my sins. What Jesus did on the cross for my sins allows me to be forgiven in the same way that somebody could be forgiven by killing an animal and, and sprinkling the blood on the altar. Something had to die because of sins in the Old Testament. So Jesus became that sacrifice. So the blood that he shed was perfect, sinless blood. I apply that to my life, and then I allow it to do what only it can do. It goes to these places in my life. It won't just remind you on Sunday morning, it'll remind you on Monday morning. You need to forgive that person today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. You need to make some changes with your personal time because you're self-medicating to get through the pain of life. And that self-medication is taking you away from me. I need you to eliminate that part of your life. That's the blood of Jesus, his purifying blood, making you new every single day. And in a minute, we're going to take communion together. Isn't that cool? Communion's kind of the same color. Because Jesus said, when you come together, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. This is the blood of the new covenant. This is, this is my blood that provides forgiveness for your sins. It can wash all that stuff away. And I wish I had like a magic marker undoer, right? You know, because that's what the blood of Jesus does. It takes the dark places, the failures, the nail that the devil wants to hang stuff on, and it pulls it out of the wall. It dissolves it chemically in a way that only God can do. And today, you might have failed your family, but God doesn't see a failure when he sees you. He sees you a child of God that is much loved. You may see yourself just kind of always coming up short. God doesn't see you that way. See, once I accept the blood of Jesus, he's always with me. He's always at work in me if I allow him to be. So I, I allow God to search my heart, and then I trust Jesus to make me free. You say, well, how do you do that, Pastor, in a practical sense? Let me give you the, 
just a little formula. For those of you that need to take step one in your faith, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And for some of you, that's just your next step. You don't know how God's going to deal with your personal life. And maybe that's the scary part. You think, Pastor, if I become a Christian, I'm going to have to give up all these things. All those things that you think you have to give up, that's this. The devil has convinced you you need the nail. And God's saying, no, listen, if you'll give that to me, I'll make something better in your life to replace it with that will surpass what you think you're losing tenfold. I promise you. Come to me. I got a feeling I think I think I need to open this altar up before we do communion. Would you stand with me? If you want to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. If you want a new you, you want to get rid of the old. You want to be free. I want I'm going to invite you forward. Today is your season for salvation. Would you come? I don't want any music, nothing. I want you to come. Is this a decision where you have decided you want to follow the creator of the universe wherever he leads you because he knows better than you do? I want you to come. It might just be one of you. Come on. But if you come, you might make room for the second person because there's many people that need this new life today. If you'll kneel right here, we're going to pray for you. This is courageous. This is new life happening. But folks, this is the easy place to do it. Here's the easy place. We're cheering for you. It worked. They're not cheering for you. It's a hostile world. You've got to get rid of all the nails, and only the Holy Spirit of God can take all the nails off the wall and give you a clean heart, a pure heart. This is where freedom's at. In the balcony, there are benches up there you can kneel at. This is your season. Your marriage is at stake. Your family's at stake. Even though you think it's a small thing, today is the season for a salvation in your home to save you from problems that are ahead. Maybe you're already saved, but that one thing keeps creeping up in your marriage and it's infecting everything. You need the blood of Jesus. You need forgiveness. Anybody else? All right, everybody bow your heads. Here we go. We're going to pray. Anybody else? You say, is this a big deal, Pastor? This is life changing. Remember how big decisions are? They can change everything. Just one decision. Father, these are your kids. You brought them today, and you brought them forward with a tug in their heart that they need more from you. They've tried on their own, and just like the Apostle Paul, they're admitting that they're a failure without your help. They need help. So in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would help them, that you would heal them. Now, if you came forward, I want you to confess with your mouth out loud right now that Jesus is the Lord, and say it with me. Say, Jesus is my Lord. Would you say that? Say this, I believe he rose from the dead. And he's forgiven me of all my sins. And Jesus, we know that that is going to be the one thing that they need to say to you when they walk into eternity. They are forgiven. They are made new by your blood. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. 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 Amen.